Good evening. It's Sunday, the 6th of December. This is our Sunday night video devotional and study from Park Street Christian Church here in El Dorado Springs, Missouri. And I'm um, preacher Steve Altide. I want to share tonight five paradoxes that shape the Christian life. Five paradoxes that shape the Christian life. A paradox is something that seems contradictory, but further consideration reveals harmony rather than contradiction. A paradox naturally has tension, two ideas pulling in different directions or two ideas counterbalancing one another. When we counter, encounter a paradox, our first inclination often is to try to resolve the tension and give greater weight to one idea or uh, over the other. Sadly, we often fail to embrace life-changing truth because we're uncomfortable with important paradoxes like these. So here's number one, lament and joy. Lament and joy. An optimist is someone who says, well, things are better than they seem. Well, a pessimist says things are as bad as I've ever seen or they're, they're worse than they seem. Both the optimist and the pessimist are uncomfortable with the Paradox that lament can actually be joyful. They want to resolve the tension one way or the other. Sadly, there's even many Christians who are very uncomfortable with this paradox of lament and joy. If a Christian publicly weeps and mourns, a well-meaning brother or sister will often say, Oh, don't be so sad. The situation really isn't that bad. At least there's all these good things. Don't focus on the painful stuff. Um, conversely, especially as it pertains to the moral condition of the world, some Christians seem to give themselves fully to lament and cry, all the world is just falling apart. If we don't do something quick, it's all going to be weapon flames. But, the, but faith is able to hold on to lament in one hand and joy in the other. We're able to say the world really is that broken. Yep, you're right. But Jesus is still making all things new. And when we have true faith, we're able to both rejoice with those who rejoice and weep with those who weep, as Paul wrote in Romans 12, 15. We're able to affirm both the horrible brokenness of this world we live in and the unbelievably great news of the gospel of Jesus Christ, what he has done, what he is doing now, and what he has promised that he's going to do yet in the future. So lament and joy is an important paradox. We have to resist the urge to resolve that tension. We must resist the urge to become either optimist or pessimist. We must be people of genuine faith who hold both joy and lament in our hands at the same time. Here's paradox number two that shapes the Christian life. Mystery and certainty. Mystery and certainty. For some Christians, faith is about embracing the mysteries, the mysterious, the unknown. For others, faith is about certainty based on what is clearly written in Scripture because some are very uncomfortable with mystery. They interpret the Bible in such a way that they seem to have an answer for all the questions. Others are uncomfortable with such dogmatic certainty and would rather say nearly everything is mysterious and we're all just guessing at what might be true. Perhaps it's best that we don't try to resolve the mystery and certainty paradox. Perhaps it's better that we learn to say, you know, there are many things of which I am certain, and there's probably about that many things that to me remain a mystery. I may be wrong about some of the things of which I am very certain, and some of the things that remain a mystery may become clear, but for the time being, I'm content right where I'm at with mystery and certainty. There should be things that we can boldly assert, like Jesus is the Son of God who reigns as King. But there are other things that are just our best guesses or about which we really have no idea. We ought to be able to live with both of those realities. As Deuteronomy chapter 29, verse 29 says, 
The secret things belong to the Lord our God, but the things that are revealed belong to us and our children forever, that we may do all the words of this law. So there's the paradox of mystery and certainty, along with the paradox of lament and joy. And thirdly, the paradox, another paradox that shapes the Christian life is contentment and zeal. Contentment and zeal. Should Christians be zealous to change the world, or should we just live quiet, reserved, content lives, waiting for Jesus to come make everything right? Should we boldly strive for a better world and resign ourselves, or resign ourselves to the fact that there is always going to be sin and brokenness until Jesus comes back? There's a natural tension between waiting with contentment and working with zeal. Some Christians try to resolve this tension by saying things like, we can't solve problems like hunger and poverty and racism or injustice. They're always going to exist. They always have. We should just preach the gospel and wait for Jesus to return. Other Christians try to resolve the tension the other way, seemingly seeming to believe that they can create a utopia, fixing all the world's problems through the right programs, policies, and presidents kings and whatever. Again, we destroy the truth when we try to resolve this tension. We are empowered by the Holy Spirit as God's children to announce the goodness of Jesus' current reign as king, to bring light and reclaim the world from the darkness of sin right now. We are commissioned by God to feed and care for our brothers and sisters, our neighbors, and even our enemies, according to Romans 12, verses 9 to 21 and 1 John 3, verses 16 to 18. But we're also privy with the knowledge that the final redemption of this world is yet to come, as Paul writes in Romans 8. Sadly, there will continue to be poverty, hungry, and injustice until Jesus is revealed from heaven, but that knowledge should not stop us from doing all the good that we have the opportunity to do, as Paul writes taught in Galatians chapter 6, verse 10. Not all of the work that is done now in this life will survive the fire of judgment, but Paul tells us in 1 Corinthians 3, verses 10 to 15, some of it will. So you've got the paradoxes of lament and joy, and the paradox of mystery and certainty, and the paradox of Contentment and zeal. Contentment and zeal. Well, here's another one. Number four, a fourth paradox that shapes the Christian life is obedience and assurance. Obedience and assurance. I've heard many followers of Jesus over the years ask on their deathbeds, sadly, do you think I've been good enough to go to heaven? I've seen a number of people who were members of churches that I served, that had been in nursing homes, or other situations late in life, and began to question and doubt their salvation. All of us can look back at any point in life, especially, I'm sure, when we're very aware of our impending death leaving this world where we see a lot of things we should have done differently we remember sins that we committed and i think satan uses that sometimes to cause us to question our salvation question god's grace and i understand where a lot of people are coming from but it's sad that elderly people um who've been christians you know nearly their entire life, you know, 60, 70, 80 years sometimes, um, go to that last, you know, uh, the 11th hour of their life and aren't confident of the power of God's grace to save them. There are many people who fit this category as well who aren't confident of their salvation who have spent a lifetime trying to earn salvation, and they're terrified that they haven't succeeded. 
But on the other hand, I've heard many ministers over the years preach funeral sermon after funeral sermon after funeral sermon sermon for incredibly worldly people. And yet the preacher would say things like, well, I know she wasn't much of a religious person, but I've been told she was saved when she was six years old. So I know she was welcomed into the arms of Jesus when she died. No, you don't know that. You don't. And you shouldn't say it. No, you don't have to preach that person into hell. That's not your job. That's a preacher. But you don't give the living false information, false uh, assurance of someone's salvation when you do not know that. There's no way in the world you can you can say that. Uh, it just isn't. Uh, you're lying if you do. Many Christians seem to believe that if we preach that salvation is by grace through faith, as Paul talked about in Ephesians 2, verse 8 and 9, that there's no motivation for obedience. They believe people need the constant fear of condemnation lurking over their shoulder to keep them on the straight and narrow. Others try to resolve this tension of obedience and assurance by saying humans are so totally depraved that salvation can't possibly be impacted one way or the other by our obedience and our faithfulness. Yet, as we read the New Testament, we find people like Paul who still struggle with sin. He admitted that himself in Romans 7. But he was fully assured that he belonged to Jesus, as he stated in Philippians 3, verse 12. At the same time, Paul also says people who live lifestyles, and that's the key word here, lifestyles of disobedience will be cut off from the people of God, as he wrote in Romans 11, verse 22. So, as paradoxical as it may seem, our obedience to God is both necessary and not yet not the basis of our salvation. So, obedience and assurance is a fourth paradox that helps shape the Christian life. And then number five is individuality and collectivity. Individuality and collectivity. The gospel acknowledges both our individuality and yet our collective belonging. We share the guilt of our communities and humanity as a whole to a certain extent, but we are able to individually join ourselves to Jesus by our faith and be grafted into a new community and a new humanity. Now, some Christians try to resolve this paradox by denying our individuality. Others try to resolve it by denying our collectivity. But the gospel can't really be understood without acknowledging that every human being is both an individual and yet a part of multiple collective groups. We all bear a responsibility to our collective communities and yet we have a responsibility to make good individual decisions, even when those decisions differ from those of our ethnic or familial communities. So the conclusion here is pretty simple. Don't be too quick to resolve tension between seemingly contradictory ideas. Sometimes the answer is less either or and a little bit more of both and. Perhaps if we were more willing to live with paradox, we would be less likely to fire Bible verses back and forth at each other on social media and verbally as if they were bullets. Perhaps if we were more willing to live with these paradoxes of the Christian life, we would be more willing to live with and love one another in the family of God. Let's pray. Father, thank you for the powerful truth of your word. We need it every breath, every day and night. It's, it provides to us the way to our living hope, Jesus Christ. Thank you for all that you've invested in us through your word, through your son, through your people in the church, the kingdom of God around us. Thank you for even many people who maybe weren't Christians at all, who still impacted us in a positive way. You worked through that still somehow 
to draw us to you or to make us stronger in our walk with you. Thank you for all the different ways that you invest in us. You value us so incredibly. We get our self-worth, our true self-image from you and you alone. Thank you for loving us, being patient with us. Help us to take to heart these laments, the, these, these paradoxes of lament and joy and collectivity and individuality and, and the paradox of obedience and assurance and to trust you, Father, to do for us what's right, as you always have. We've got your track record. We thank you that you have revealed many things to us and we can say with certainty we have confidence in truth of your word and yet there are so many things that seem mysterious that we don't understand yet. Some of those mysteries are solved as we mature in Christ over the years and we have those aha moments where we wonder why we couldn't see something before years ago. And most of the time that's because we weren't ready to understand it. We weren't mature enough at the time. Uh, but you opened our eyes in time. And we, as we obey with the light that we have and take that step in that light, uh, as we continue to journey through this life, walking by faith, you give us more light to walk by. Thank you again for loving us and for the salvation we have in your son, Jesus. And I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.